Hi everyone, welcome to the Australian Robotics Network Trust and Safety Workshop. Um, it's really fantastic to have everyone with us today uh, out there. We've got a great uh, set of speakers to talk to today and we're all going to be contributing content and ideas and some structures and frameworks to assist us in writing a chapter for the uh, Australian Robotics Roadmap version 2 that Sue Kay is putting together. And I um, thank Sue Kay for the opportunity to work with these um, great researchers today and the, and the participants in trying to find some answers to how we manage trust and safety with robotics and autonomous systems in Australia and to connect up a network of people who have expertise in this area as we confront the potential challenges of regulating uh, robots. Uh, so the way today is going to work is it's just a brief introduction from me and uh, then Andrew Scott is going to introdu introduce us to the collaborative tool we're going to use for this session, uh, Miro. And you should have a link that Sue Kay has sent earlier this morning to get to that Miro board. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, a set of speakers. So we're going to have speakers from the 3AI Institute in uh, Canberra. So uh, Zina Assad and uh, Ellen Broad, which is going to be great. And we're going to have another speaker from uh, ANU, uh, Hannah uh, Kunawati. And uh, Hannah has been actually contributing to the York University International Framework for the Assurance of uh, AI and Autonomous Systems. And uh, this is an amazing set of uh, body of body of knowledge around assurance that I highly recommend people uh, check out because it's just been recently uh, revealed publicly uh, for those who are interested. And we're going to finish off with Seth Lazar from the Humanising Machine Intelligence Group at ANU. And uh, after that, we're going to have a nice uh, collaborative and interactive session using the Miro tool for 20 minutes, uh, which I encourage you to utilise. But the Miro tool will be available for two weeks after today's session. So if uh, you want to continue to add your thoughts, please do so. We really welcome that content that we'll use to shape the chapter. Uh, also, Sue, I believe, will put the URL to the survey. Uh, which I also recommend you fill out because it's via the survey that we really get a good handle on what the ecosystem in Australia thinks are the issues that need to be considered and what potential solutions to those issues might be. Uh, so myself, I'll introduce myself now. Uh, so my name is Kate Devitt. I'm uh, the Deputy Chief Scientist of the Trusted Autonomous Systems Defence Cooperative Research Centre in Brisbane, Australia. And I focus predominantly on social licence issues pertaining to autonomous systems. So those facts that affect the trust of those systems, whether that's the ethics, legal, regulatory uh, or other social licence uh, issues that might be faced, um, I'm really focusing on those areas. And that's me. And uh, so I might pass it over to you, Andrew. Okay. Thank you, Kate. So I'm just going to share my screen while we, um, so hopefully people can see uh, my screen. Yep, you can. Of course, it's pulled up everything I didn't want to pull up. So <laughs> uh, bear with me. Um, here we go. So I'm just going to give a quick uh, introduction to uh, Miro. But before I get going, I will introduce myself. So my name's Andrew Scott. For those who don't know me, uh, I'm the uh, executive chairman of uh, the Queensland Robotics, which is an economic development cluster uh, based here in Queensland. Uh, but I'm also a working group uh, or vice chair of working groups for an organisation called the Global Mining Guidelines. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to give a bit of a perspective of some of the insights uh, from that in, in a little bit later. But first off, in way of introducing Miro. So Miro is a collaborative tool. Uh, and some of you who uh, have uh, been working with collaborative tools may have come across it, but some of you may not. So it, think of it like a, a um, a cross between a whiteboard and a, uh, you know, a, a ability to use uh, sticky notes, uh, and it really is to to foster uh, collaboration and foster engagement. So I'll just give some more orientation. So there's a toolbar on the uh, left hand side. The key tools that I want you to sort of think about using is the pointer uh, and this sticky note tool. So you can be creative. Choose your favourite colour. Um, choose a um, once you've chosen a favourite colour of a sticky note, you can place it on the board, and I'll just zoom in a bit because uh, it's a bit harder to easier to see. Um, and you can type your idea. Now on the on this board on this uh, you can also give yourself a bit of an icon as well, so you can choose a happy face or a thumbs up. 
what that allows is other people to you know, essentially vote on your idea or reinforce your idea. Now, a trick for young players is that you can actually, once you've done that action, it's fairly easy to double click and create the, uh, the, the last known um, action, uh, which is the, the sticky note. So that's a, an easy way to, to, uh, uh, to, to add uh, content. Now, we are encouraging you to, to interact with the boards wherever you, you see fit. Uh, so don't feel obliged that you have to go board by board. Um, I will sort of introduce a, another tool that we're going to use this afternoon, or this afternoon, at the end of the session, and that's this brainstorming um, sort of tool. Uh, again, it's a, you can, you'll see type something here. That's where you can type something. And then where you see a little plus, you can actually add uh, another item to, to extend the brain map. Uh, so we'll be looking at that uh, later on. The other key thing that I want you to, um, uh, I guess, um, I wanted to point out is as we get going, and if you find the the, the 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 zooming around of all the icons a bit too much, you can actually turn that off. So there's an icon next to these faces up the top here, uh, so you can turn all the flying icons off if you if you wish. The last thing that I want to introduce is that there is a notes um, pad. Uh, so next time you come back uh, after this session, you can check this out to, for any other uh, notes or, or uh, um, notices or instructions that um, we might have left for you. So at the moment, it's pretty brief. Basically, we want you to, you to engage in, in, um, uh, in this session, and it's a chance for you to, to, uh, to look at. And I see that we've got one board that uh, wasn't locked um, and has been moved, so apologies for, for Seth. Uh, I didn't have that locked, but the other thing I wanted to highlight is as we, as you go through the, the or listening to each of the speakers, I've got a board for each of the speakers. So there's Kate, and Kate's got some key questions that uh, she's going to illustrate during her session. I'm going to actually talk through my session on the board itself, um, and likewise with um, uh, Zena and Ellen, Hannah and Seth. So each of them have a board. So as they're going to talk through or present, um, they're going to um, reference that. Now I'm going to deep dive into my section, which is really just a, 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 um, a bit of a view of what's going on in the resource space with regards to safety uh, and trust. So one of the things that, uh, that uh, has happened over the number of years, and, and Australia is actually well known for the, um, the amount of um, uh, autonomous systems in the, in, in particular, the autonomous haulage space. So uh, we're probably still the world leaders in that, in terms of the number of um, autonomous haulage equipment and now autonomous drilling equipment. But we're start, you know, there's a lot of other com countries are, are uh, rapidly catching up to us. So, but the one thing to note is that there was, uh, as uh, Rio Tinto and BHP were rolling out their systems in the Pilbara. Uh, followed by uh, FMG, there was actually pro some proactive engagement with the department of, of uh, with the regulator, local regulator. And so they actually produced this uh, code of practice over a series of, of, um, of interaction sessions uh, with the objective to make sure that there is a, a risk-based approach to dealing with uh, implementing of autonomous systems uh, in the resource um, sector. And in particular, in the open pit uh, mining uh, sector. And it's, if you go around the world, you'll actually notice uh, there's, uh, and in particular, the oil sands guys um, treat this as the key Bible or key reference document. Um, and so it really is a, a, a useful guide. It's, it's fairly, still very high level, and it does, uh, has a lot of uh, references to the Western Australian uh, context. Now, one thing that uh, I should, uh, um, Sort of talk about is is the this is where the the industry and this diagram is actually um, thanks to Nova Systems uh, who participate quite actively in the discussion uh, of uh, system safety, functional safety uh, for the resource sector. Uh, and so this diagram is a, a great place to start in terms of uh, you know putting into perspective the the expectations of safety um, from a society perspective. Uh, and then the safety management systems, and then going deeper into the actual safety systems itself. Uh, 
Um, and so there's, as a result of uh, some work that was done in the development of a implementation guideline for autonomous systems for the resource space, there was a uh, focus on the functional safety. There was a really, felt, it really was felt that there needed to be a, a guideline uh, to help organisations understand the, the functional safety aspects. Uh, and so that was worked on and there's actually, I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, but what it's also done is uh, there's a, a, a large um, collection of, of others that are engaged in, in the key aspects of trust and um, uh, safety aspects of the resource sector. And I'll just point out a couple of key ones. Immersed is a group that was actually uh, formed to make sure that there was engagement between the mine operators, so the users of the equipment and the equipment manufacturers. Uh, and so that group is at the moment very focused on vehicle interaction. Uh, and so as you could imagine, the autonomous equipment has a high degree of that aspect. This other group that I'll uh, highlight is the ICMMM, which is the International Council of Mining and Metals, which represents the top 28 uh, mining companies. And it, when I say we represents, it actually has on the committee the CEOs of those companies. Uh, and they drive the agenda of what's the right behaviour we want to see in the industry. So very much focused uh, on maintaining uh, safe operations um, and uh, you know dealing with a lot of uh, key um, uh, issues that the industry focuses on. And so safe operations is a key one. So they're a big contributor. Uh, and then the Global Mining Guidelines Group is a, is a multi-stakeholder group that's also representing other aspects of the industry. So out of this, there was a lot of work done to sort of collaborate and, and work on aligning uh, a series of white papers and, and guidelines. Now, one of the things out of that work that's become very uh, evident is that uh, there is definitely um, the need to uh, highlight or describe or get an understanding across the industry of, of the types of, of systems that we've got av available uh, and the key aspects of it. And so there's at the moment, there's, there's quite a, a big conversation around deterministic and non-deterministic aspects of automation. Uh, and what uh, this diagram sort of tries to highlight is, is, the, uh, is some of the, the key aspects and, and the differences uh, between them uh, in terms of the base features of the, of the machine versus the autonomous systems uh, of those machines. Um, and so that work is, is really important to also highlight where the various standards uh, are applying. But this non-deterministic area still requires a lot more uh, description, uh, a lot more understanding, because the uh, the onset of a lot of um, AI assistance, machine learning, algorithm-based aspects of the uh, of the technology really does uh, play to this non-deterministic aspect, and so there's still a lot more understanding uh, that needs to to happen. Now, just focusing in on the um, a bit on the the functional safety aspects. Uh, I wanted to sort of just highlight uh, the, the approach. So the approach has very much been a, a life cycle approach. Uh, and it's been also looking at the fact that we've got a lot of uh, evolution of technology um, and there is a desire for a, um, see that I didn't lock that, uh, that object down either, um, the uh, interaction between the product development and the actual application of the systems uh, to ensure safe operation. So if we go down to a, the next diagram, it basically is highlighting the interaction. So this is purely an example, um, but the, the concept here is that to understand that the, in the product development life cycle, there are some key steps, but also in the application of the technology, there are some key steps. But there's also a high degree of interaction that's required uh, to, to ensure safe operation. So this is a realisation that the resource uh, sector is, is definitely uh, focusing on and it's leveraged off the, uh, the, the code of uh, practice that was developed for, for the um, surface operations in, in, in the Pilbara. Uh, and so this is actually stimulating a really positive discussion between the manufacturers, the equipment developers uh, and the application um, providers or, or the, the actual people using the equipment. Uh, and so it's helping to clarify uh, the, the, uh, the, the necessary steps and the ne necessary aspects uh, to ensure safer operation. And, and finally, you know, the, 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 there is definitely a, um, 
uh, a perspective or realization that the future is heading uh, away from us at a, a fast rate of knots. Um, and so through collaboration uh, and through actually projects like this one, which is actually developing a roadmap, uh, is actually a, is key to ensuring that uh, we have common language, we have common uh, capability, uh, understanding, uh, and we have a basis to have the necessary conversations. Uh, so with that, I'll hand over back to you, Kate, or back to um, whoever's next. I think Zena, Zena, sorry, Zena is going to um, curate questions for us, Andrew. So I'll hand it over to you, Zena. Thanks, Kate. At this stage, I don't see any questions posed to Andrew. I'll, I'll give it a, a minute if anyone would like to pose a question to Andrew. While people are thinking of any questions, I did pose, uh, put some links. So there is a link to that West Australian document in on the board. Uh, so you're more than happy to, uh, to have a look at that. Um, but yeah, any questions, you can actually place a sticky note on my section of the board and I'll keep an eye on that as well. So you can use the chat feature, you can use the board, uh, and even after this, uh, this um, uh, session, if you've got any questions that come up, you can place them on the board and I'll keep an eye on that. Okay, Andrew, we've got one question here from Jason. Why is the separation by determinist, deterministic slash non-deterministic? Is the concern predictability? Behavioural predictability might be lower, but still provide bounded guarantees. Yeah, I think it comes back to the trust. Uh, so I think we're from a, a technology um, awareness, uh, technology trust perspective, um, we're still in that uh, that early stages, um, and so I think it is that uh, probability perspective uh, is that we, um, and you've got to remember the resource sector is incredibly uh, conservative uh, because we are talking about very large piece of equipment uh, and with a lot of momentum. Uh, and so if these pieces of equipment, if anything goes wrong, things can go really wrong. Um, and so there is that aspect, both the equipment manufacturers are conservative in their approach and also to, to, uh, to help illustrate technology development from ideation through to product commercialization is a minimum of 10 to 15 years. Uh, and there is a high amount of testing and retesting and, and uh, a, a lot of work goes in. So there's, I think that's the key issue here is that as we're uh, applying these different algorithms um, and working out the, the validation verification um, processes, how do we verify a model? How do we verify the, the learning data sets? And, and how do we verify and, you know, that uh, these systems are gonna behave the way that we want them to behave? So I think that's the underlying issue. Hope that helps. Were there any more questions for Andrew at this stage? Okay, if not, I think then it's safe to move on to the next speaker. So Kate, I'll just pass back to you. Sure, thanks everyone. And I apologize for failing to give an acknowledgement of country. Uh, that's definitely my bad. So I would like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yogara people as the First Nations owners of the lands in which I am sitting today. Uh, and there's a beautiful uh, old gold mining track at the back of my place that I love to go on, which is um, got a little creek that uh, is named after that Turrbal Nations area. And it's really lovely to walk along that creek and feel the energy of, of this country. Uh, and we pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. And we recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, uh, research and learning. Uh, and I acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play uh, within our communities and particularly around securing uh, what we're doing here and trust and safety has to include uh, respect for our cultural heritage. Um, so yes, my apologies for that before. Best thing I can do is to make up as best I can for that error and acknowledge it and, and own it. Um, but with that uh, acknowledgement, I hope we can move on to our next speakers um, from 3AI. So uh, Zena, actually, it's gonna be back to you and Ellen um, to, to give your presentation and thanks all.
Sorry, all sharing my screen lost me the mute button. So I'm just going to share my screen again and we can get started. Um, mute, the unmute button disappeared when I tried to open the, there we go. Okay, so um, hello everyone. My name's Ellen Broad. Uh, I'm from the 3A Institute. I'm going to give a really brief introduction to the 3A and then pass over to my colleague Zena to talk about trust and safety in the context of the roadmap. Um, I also wanted to start with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, for Zena and I, we're sitting on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Um, the image that you're looking at is an image of OP, the uh, language robot from the Social Robotics Lab in Queensland. I'm not sure if we have anyone from the Social Robotics Lab on the call. Kate has her hand up. Fantastic. They were kind enough to take me around their lab to learn more about their, the range of social robots that they're developing, including OP. OP is um, a robot developed in conjunction with the Nuku Language Centre um to help with um educating uh children uh in Nuku about the Nuku language and it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that uh, our workshop takes place in the context of reconciliation week um and that uh as kate um has also commented that we have kind of a duty uh, to respect and uh, safeguard the cultural heritage of what is the oldest living civilization on the planet. So I just wanted to pay my respects as well. Um, really, very quickly, um, what is the 3AI? We are building a new branch of engineering to manage cyber physical systems safely, sustainably and responsibly at scale. Um, we were founded by distinguished professor Genevieve Bell at the Australian National University in 2017. I joined the 3A Institute six months ago as a senior fellow. Um, the staff at the 3AI are incredibly diverse in our disciplinary backgrounds. We include systems engineers, nuclear physicists, computer scientists, roboticists, photographers, anthropologists, my background is primarily in data and software standards and in data governance. Um, and I guess in that context, a little bit in AI ethics as well. So the kind of um, the, the th thinking behind the 3A Institute and Genevieve's um, kind of the history that she draws on to inform its thinking can be traced back to the origins of cybernetics which is now more than 75 years old. Um, I would say to kind of build on Andrew's um, excellent introduction to safety in the resources sector that we're really kind of squarely in the non-deterministic space. We're really interested in cyber physical systems that are being developed that sense, infer and act on um, information that they receive about the world and about people in ways that we previously haven't kind of used in production before. Um, how do we do it at the 3A Institute? So a huge part of our work is teaching this new branch of engineering who will be managing these kinds of systems safely at scale into existence. So students both spend a year building cyber physical systems as well as learning to probe them and think about them in the context of a range of approaches. Um, across the 3A's work, we draw on systems engineering uh, principles and approaches, cybernetics of systems methodologies, as well as, of course, um, our expertise in computer science, anthropology, social sociology and civil engineering. So we really try to take a multidisciplinary approach to thinking about concepts like trust and safety. We also do a lot of observational research. We um, have been working on exploring autonomous vehicles on mine sites in the Pilbara. We've also been involved in research involving underwater vehicles in the Great Barrier Reef, as well as looking at complex recommendation systems in financial institutions, where usually what we're trying to do 
is take um, the A's and the I's that are inherent in the name of the 3A Institute um, to try to think about cyber physical systems by multiple dimensions. So unpacking concepts like trust and safety, um, not only in terms of standards and regulations, but things like the um, interfaces between people and systems and the interfaces within systems to other components of that system. And I'll pass over to Zena here, who's going to talk a little bit more about some of these concepts in the context of the robotics roadmap. So Zena, over to you. We will have to Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> Hi everyone, as Ellen said, my name is Zena. I'm also a research fellow at the 3A Institute. I have a background in aerospace engineering and some experience working in a regulatory space. I'm gonna talk a little bit about trust and safety in the broader context of software systems and cyber physical systems. Now, Ellen has provided a brief description of what we mean when we refer to cyber physical systems uh, in her introduction to the 3A Institute. Can I get you to go to the next slide, please, Ellen? Sure can. Thank you. So what do we mean when we speak about trust and safety in the context of software systems and cyber physical systems? When we speak about trust, we think about concepts like accuracy. So how do we measure and verify the precision of the outcome of these systems? Uh, we think about indicators. How do we measure performance and success? Assurance. How do we provide confidence in these systems? And how do we measure assurance? And integrity. How can we provide trust in these systems? It's important to recognize that trust is a human concept. It's multifaceted and it expands into a mix of behaviours and interfaces. It's also important to note that the concepts that I've spoken about only touch the surface of the many different elements that make up the discussion around trust. Um, next slide, please, Ellen. So now when we talk about safety, we think about concepts such as interfaces. How will these systems interact with our world? A great example of this is autonomous cars. An autonomous system is predictable, but humans are not. So what will our roads and our traffic systems look like when we have a combination of autonomous and manually driven cars? We look at things like agency, how much human intervention will we require and mandate or why? I anticipate that this will heavily depend on the application and the industry. Intent, which looks at purpose, why are these systems being built and for who? And finally, autonomy. How do we determine what is a safe level of autonomy for the application of a system? Again, these concepts really do not cover the full depth of the discussion around safety. They're simply an indication of the areas of discussion that we want to facilitate in this workshop. Next slide, please, Alan. So currently there's a patchwork of standards and regulations emerging to govern software systems and cyber physical systems. However, at this stage, there is limited regulatory requirements that have emerged around the trust and safety of these systems. The, currently, the ISO group responsible for the global robotic standards is ISO 299. These standards cover safety requirements for industrial robots and robot systems. They're relevant to robot manufacturers, integrators and users. But what they don't cover is more diverse robotic industries and software and learning systems. In Australia, robotics are regulated differently depending on the sector that they're applicable to. So for example, robotics in medical interventions that fit the definition of a medical device are required to meet a standard set by the Therapeutic Goods Administration or TGA. And all manufacturers, integrators and users of robots are required to comply with workplace health and safety laws and consumer laws. What is less clear though, is the extent to which more indirect forms of harm are considered. So for example, systems that result in changes to their environments or systems that simply over time just stop working as they were initially intended. Cyber physical systems are a rapidly maturing industry. The industry is in transition and it becomes pretty critical to bring automated systems to market responsibly. So to do this, we need to look at a few different things. Uh, next slide, please, Ellen. We need to look at mechanisms of assurance and ask questions like, how do we measure assurance? How do we provide a level of confidence in these systems? And how or if we choose to define levels of assurance for different components of a system, or if we choose to measure and define assurance of the complete system. Next slide, please, Ellen. We also need to look at testing. So what does it look like when static testing is no longer viable due to the rate at which upgrades to these systems are being distributed? What will testing look like in a dynamic world? Next slide, please, Ellen. And standards are also a critical consideration in the context of trust and safety. 
we need to ask questions like how do we develop effective standards at a parallel rate to this rapidly advancing industry? And also how do we leverage existing standards to safely implement regulatory requirements at a mirrored pace to this advancing industry? All right, final slide, please, Alan. We'd now like to pose some discussion questions to the audience for input. You can contribute to these questions through Miro. So if you open up Miro, there's a board labeled Autonomy, uh, Autonomy Agency and Assurance Institute with Alan and my name on the top. Um, these questions are listed in that box and there's some space below allowing for your contribution. The first question, uh, what can we learn from current safety practices and standards and how can these be applied to autonomous systems? So as I mentioned, there are a few regulatory requirements around software and learning systems. However, safety standards and practices for those areas are pretty limited. So how can we leverage the existing body of knowledge to inform regulatory requirements for these autonomous systems? Uh, the second question is what new roles, processes and regulatory interventions might be needed? So what are the gaps that we need to fill? What are the additional considerations we need to make for these systems? And then the final question, how is trust manifested in current systems? This goes back to building on the existing body of knowledge and dissecting how trust is manifested in current systems and identifying how we can utilize and transform this for future systems. Thank you everyone. That's all for me at this stage. Uh, were there any questions? see one here from Robert. Do you utilize any of the established standards for regulated medical device development such as IEC 62304 for SW or ISO 19471 for risk management? Um, I personally can't answer this question. I don't work in a particular area where I would have to use these standards, but Andrew, can you shed some light on this question at all? Is this applicable to you? familiar with that particular standard or um but uh i think what one thing that uh you know i was probably trying to illustrate and, and i didn't probably highlight in um enough detail is that there are actually a lot of uh, a lot of standards um and they're um some of them cross over a little bit uh and so i wouldn't be surprised if this one actually is uh, uh without knowing the details of that standard um, I wouldn't be surprised if it does actually cross over a couple of others, um, depending on the, the the context. So this is the the uh, the, the real dilemma, um, and often there's a, a work to be done to explain how to use the the standards in the uh, the context in which they were originally um, designed, but then also in these uh, these grey zones um, that are also existing. So yeah, apologies I couldn't uh, be specific, but uh, yeah. Um, uh, it's a good question. Just to add, to Anna, um, just to add to that, um, I and to echo Andrew's point, and I think you made this too during your presentation that there there are likely to be a wide range of standards that are relevant to specific applications and kinds of development of robotics in different sectors. I know. Um, Last year, we had students looking at standards that the TGA administers or draws on from the ISO. Um, I think what we'd be really interested in feedback on the Miro board about is um, how, like the areas of overlap that Andrew alludes to, or areas where um, a gap exists that makes joining work across standards difficult. I'm thinking particularly in the context of systems that are being developed that are multi-purpose or have um, that fall within um, a kind of network of standards that they need to draw on simultaneously. So we're kind of very interested in people's experience working within standards. Thanks, Alan. That was good. Uh, Kate, do we still have a minute to answer another question? Yeah, we do. Actually, we've got six minutes if you want it, and it, we can also move on to the next speaker and have more time at the end. So go with the um, questions for now, Zena. Right. Well, there's one more question here. So how about we answer this one and then we can move on from that. I've got a question from Paul. The Australian Navy are about to create a new career path for personnel interested in robotics and AI. 
would be interested in the views of all or any of the speakers as to what type of skill set would be needed in the field slash at sea, the new branch will open to both engineers and operators and then in brackets poets with a question mark. Ellen, would you like to tackle this one? Whew. I feel um, that this is a conversation we could have in greater detail because that's very much kind of at the heart of what 3A is trying to do is um, determine the skill set that a new kind of engineer will require in order to understand systems that draw on machine learning and artificial intelligence. And our sense is that the skills that these kinds of professionals will require is not just an understanding of the technical components of a cyber physical system, so not just an understanding of kind of the role and the relationship that um, software and hardware and um, the uh, kinds of computational techniques that are used in the construction of a cyber physical system, but we'll have, um, we'll, we'll need to be able to draw on kind of more systems engineering type approaches. So have more um, global kind of perspective on the systems being developed in a particular context and how they interact with humans in the environment. Because particularly when we talk about non-deterministic systems that are learning and evolving, you cannot simply focus inwards on a technical system. So happy to have this conversation in more detail because I don't think we we're testing this out. We're testing a number of kind of skills development pathways, um, but that's our gut is it's going to require a mix of what you might call um, computational or technical skills or awareness of, of what those skills are and how you draw on other teams as well as this kind of broader view of the environment within they, which they operate. Thanks, Alan. That was a really great answer. Um, if you just look at the chat bar, there are a few extra responses to your response. Um, I, I think the chat bar, I don't think, but you... right, I'll, I'll copy and paste them for you. Awesome. OK, Kate, um, I think we'll answer one more question and then move on to the next person. Is that OK time wise? Fantastic. Okay, so there's one from Natalia. It says, do you expect standards applicable to autonomous systems to be dynamic as opposed to static standards as applied to non-autonomous systems? I think that's a really tough question to answer. And I think the answer is potentially yes. Autonomous systems are very different to their non-autonomous counterparts. Uh, they behave very differently. And so the way that we approach the safety standards for them will have to be different. Whether or not they are dynamic, I think will be highly dependent on the application in which the autonomous system is being used and the industry that it's used within, and whether or not to ensure safety, we would actually need and require dynamic standards. So if a static standard was applicable, was able to provide a safe level, a, a acceptable level of safety, then potentially not. But the thing is, there's just a very big question mark around what these autonomous systems will look like 20 years from now and how they'll impact our industries and therefore what standards and regulations we'll need around them. Would you like to move on to the next speaker now, Kate? Sure, will. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so we're going to move on to our third uh, speaker, uh, Hannah, well, fourth speaker, third talk, um, Hannah Kurnawati from ANU. So over to you, Hannah. Okay, let me try to share my slides. Let me see how I can do that. So do you see my slides? Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks, uh, Kate, uh, for the opportunity to talk in here. And so, well, first I will acknowledge the and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respect to the elders past and present. And so perhaps a little bit of my introduction for myself. So I'm Hannah, I'm an academic at the Research School of Computer Science in ANU. And my research focus on the algorithms and software for robot autonomy, specifically, specifically on the robust decision making and planning. So not exactly on the safety science and engineering or the regulation of it, but uh, 
recently my team and I have been working with the Assuring Autonomy International Program, uh, which is initiated by uh, University of York and Lloyd Foundation in the UK, uh, contributing on the technology side uh, for their body of knowledge in developing practical guidance for assuring robotics and autonomous system. So what I'm going to talk about is, is a high level overview of some of the things we have and we are learning, uh, especially on, as I mentioned, on the technology side of this. And so for talking about this, I think uh, it's useful to divide this into the what and the who. So first about the, uh, the what, what is being assured? So when we talk about robotics and autonomous systems, it consists of uh, software, hardware, and their integration, obviously. Uh, but perhaps uh, I want to talk first about the algorithms and software because that's sort of the main thing, it seems, that differentiate between the robots we see today, the intelligent robots, uh, from uh, just a machine, for instance. So in terms of algorithms and software, I think I want to highlight that it's important for us to clarify that algorithms are different than software. Usually it's, it's just considered that they are the same, but they're actually not. So algorithms is, is about the methods, about the concepts and procedure of computing to what we want to get. And the software is essentially just an implementation of those algorithms. But of course, even if we have the best algorithms in the world, but if the implementation is quite lousy, then those nice properties of the algorithms are not going to get into what we what we interact with. We are not going to see that in the system we have. Right. So in terms of the, the algorithms itself, I think it's useful to ask questions on, so what, what's the reliability of the algorithms? How repeatable are the results? Uh, even though there's non-determinism, there are actually ways to see whether this is repeatable or not. And how robust is it when things go wrong? Uh, what are the resources, computational resources that's needed? What's the time and space complexity? What's the safe guarantees? Are there any such things or not? Now, of course, I do understand that most of the uh, computational problems in robotics and autonomous systems are considered hard computational problems. And so we don't expect that we have algorithms that 100% guarantee safety, for instance. Uh, if we try to do that, perhaps uh, it's difficult to make any advances. Right? But what's important is being clear uh, on the assumptions and parameters on which these algorithms are going to operate well, and what does this mean, right? what, how do we characterize them? So that's about the algorithm side. Now about the implementation side. So uh, one thing is that the question becomes when we implement the algorithms into software, does the algorithm properties actually satisfied? Uh, so in many of the cases, um, we, we are perhaps we are a little bit messy in the implementation, and those are not satisfied. And sometimes you don't even check. That's that's creating a bit of a problem. So there has actually been examples of where this kind of standard guarantees are being applied. It's quite uh, old from the C++ standard library, for instance. They require the functionalities to have certain time complexity, for instance. Like if you have a sort in C++ standard library, it has to run within certain time complexity and lock end, that is. Uh, so those kind of guarantees are not exactly there yet in many of the software for robotics and autonomous systems. But we can we can take uh, examples from from those existing uh, way I think, uh, and of course there's uh, good software engineering is always useful and always necessary for this. What that means is that we need to be uh, mindful and careful doing the testing from unit testing to all the way to the system testing. Now I think this is also getting quite interesting because then we start seeing the difference between robotics and autonomous system or the software in robotics and autonomous systems compared to in other systems. I think the main difference is that this type of software need to interact with the physical world. First is that it must abide to the law of physics. So we cannot have cartoon physics, if, if you are familiar with that. But so it has to abide with this. So that can be beneficial, but on the other hand, 
uh, in many cases, it's also difficult to know exactly. So we have heard about the non-determinism that people were talking about. So one of it is because we in oftentimes we don't know the exact parameters of the physics we are operating with. The simplest case, if we want to have a robot to push objects, uh, usually we don't know the uh, coefficient of frictions of the table where the object rise, for instance. Uh, right. So, so uh, those kind of things means that we can't exactly compute what the outcome of our actions going to be, and that's uh, exactly where the non-determinism then it, it leads to non-determinism. And in addition to that, because the system needs to understand what's going on still, so the system th seems tends to be large because we need to have. Uh, software and algorithms for the perception, for instance, for understanding the sensors, extracting information from there. And then we also need other components. We need uh, those that high level planning to figure out what the robot is supposed to be doing uh, on a global scale, then the low level control and, may, and then handling all the uncertainties in between as well. So this creates a scalability issue usually in terms of testing. And of course, the use of machine learning, which by definition means that the computer now is able to improve over time. And then the regular and updates and patches means that, well, we need to be able to test in a very large scale very fast. And so usually people use static test cases, for instance, that will be very difficult to, to do. There are uh, ways of doing automated uh, uh, testing in software engineering, but then usually it hits the scalability issue, for instance. So there are these questions on what kind of uh, tools, what kind of technology uh, will be sufficient for doing uh, this massive scale of testing. And of course, the variety of the scenarios we face when the system is operating on the physical world does not help. So that's about the algorithms and software. Now, about the hardware, it, it's, it's easy for us to think that, well, this is a bit more established. It's perhaps static testing can be used. But if we see the development in hardware, there's also new types of how hardware to software and compliance robots. So it used to be uh, with rigid robots, for instance, you can uh, you can identify the dynamics of the robot. So you know if you provide a particular control input, what might happen next. But with soft and compliance robots, then now the dynamics also depends on what is the robot interacting with. And so now suddenly that nice deterministic uh, system identification might be a little bit difficult to handle uh, that we cannot just treat this as noise, but it's actually substantial error, for instance. Right? And, and the, the variety of the interaction that might happen, the variety of objects that the hardware can interact with will also uh, matter. So the integration of them, well, of course, if we talk about the software has extremely large variety of, of scenarios that we need to test with, the hardware also have different types of scenarios we have to test with, the software and hardware definitely is going to be even more. Right? So, so now the question becomes when we integrate them, even small things like perhaps the problem is because the hardware has lack of battery. It's not depleted yet, but the lack of battery actually causes the, the entire system to become slower and then the computation becomes slower and it doesn't actually compute what we want it to compute. So there are those kind of issues as well. Um, again, the difficulty with this is, well, how do we cover the different uh, cases for testing? So there need to be some characterization of these components, a clear one. This is, this is in itself is difficult because in many cases we are not even clear what is the metric we should use for complexity of the problem. So unlike the sorting example in the beginning, we know exactly it's just the size of the elements, for instance. In here, the question becomes, uh, how, in many cases, it's not as straightforward. Let's and then the scalability uh, of the automated testing, there's also a question. We can uh, try to use simulation for these testing cases to cover uh, uh, as many as we want, but then there is a discrepancy in the fidelity of the simulation we have today once we have interaction with the physical world. So uh, now about the who, I'll be quite quick for, uh, for this. So, um, in the WHO, we see that there's uh, different people who would like to have some kind of assurance of the things that uh, that they have. 
So one is developers. A lot of the things I've said just now would apply to developers, uh, in particular when developers want to combine the different components. And then the users, well, in this case, we need to somehow give the users the ability to differentiate between different system in perhaps at a quite high level and also something that they understand quickly. Right? So we don't expect them to know exactly the different methods and the different approaches and so on. Regulators becomes, so who would give the licensing? Who would do this testing? Uh, what type of training is needed uh, for doing this testing and licensing, for instance, certifying? And then the, in terms of who is actually doing the assurance, which is related to the regulator, uh, then the question becomes, when will this assurance done? Is it uh, before the release or once it's released? So prior to purchase, regular maintenance. And then the question also becomes, uh, how about if you sell your robots, for instance, the secondhand robots, who, who should be uh, responsible for doing the testing and certifying for those? So in all those things, what that means is that we need different levels of this testing. We need different levels of assurance. And in addition to the different levels, we also need to be able to handle this massive scale testing fast. Because as we mentioned in the beginning, things will, uh, the algorithm, it's, the software itself improves over time and usually it can improve fast. And the uh, addition of data also change the behavior perhaps. And also the, the, uh, the patches and the updates are quite regular as well. So, so how do we handle those kind of uh, testing, for instance? Uh, so that's basically the end. So uh, if you forget everything I said, basically, uh, I wanted to just say that a steering autonomous system, it seems to be an old problem, but there's a new twist, twist in this uh, that requires additional tools uh, to existing solutions due to the scale of it, the frequency, and the different levels that we need to handle. So, and with that, I'm done. So let me see if I can stop sharing. Yes. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was fantastic. Uh, I don't see any questions in the comment bar at this stage. Uh, and I am very aware of the fact that we are running a little bit behind on time, so we'll probably pass over to Seth. But can I please ask if anyone's got any questions for Hannah, can you please use the Q&A function on WebEx and that way she'll have a moment to um, to address those questions for you. But I think I think we can pass on to Seth at this stage. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. I think in terms of timing, we're okay, Zena, because uh, 15 minutes for Seth from 11.55 to 12.10. Uh, us so we should feel we're okay I think all right no problem well there are no questions at this stage <laughs> so <laughs> that's okay <laughs> but, but, uh, but I think we're okay on time no worries well are we happy to pass over to Seth at this stage all right thank you Seth you're ready to go okay thank you very much and thanks to um to Hannah and to, to you Zena and to Ellen for those brilliant presentations mine's gonna be a bit more rudimentary um but I'd also like to start by um Acknowledging, in my case, the Narago people. Um, I'm recording in Michelago, New South Wales, so part of the Monero Tablelands, um, which were Narago country. Um, so I'd like to pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So now I'm going to share my screen, which, all being well, might lead to an infinite regress. Let's see. Okay. Kate, can you nod if, I've, if you're seeing my screen okay? Good. All right, so um, Kate asked me to come on here to tell you a bit about this research project uh, that I'm the project leader of at the ANU. So I'm a professor of philosophy there, um, and we had this project that um, was funded by the Grand Challenge Scheme and by the colleges um, in a competition a couple of years ago. The Grand Challenge Scheme was intended and was introduced in order to bring researchers together from across the ANU um, to work together on problems, that, so the big thorny problems and that will enable us to achieve very significant impact um, over the coming years and will be able us to enable us to tie together our strengths in fundamental research um, with um, really making a, a difference. So ours um, got up a couple of years ago, it's the team um, that I'm gonna tell you a little bit about and then at the end, I'm going to um, sort of go through an example of the kind of work that we're doing, um, which does have some connections to the trust and safety thing. Um, I've just been doing a redesign of our website 
Um, so, and I've just found this artist who I love, Dario Veruari, um, and this software, which I'm definitely going to learn how to use, called Houdini. Um, so there's going to be a lot of gratuitous use of that imagery um, throughout these slides. Um, okay, so let's start. So what's the problem that we are, are aiming to address? So obviously, um, we're all aware that data and AI are increasingly being used in applications that have higher stakes, that are more pervasive, and have less human involvement at crucial points. So each of those things is kind of a dimension along which you should, could measure um, how serious some particular application is going to be. Um, so, you know, if you're using AI to, um, to, to have an, an emoji accurately map the features of your face while you pretend to be a poo, then that's obviously very low stakes. Um, but if you're talking about using it in order to administer um, social welfare, then that's very high moral stakes. If you're talking about autonomous weapons, very high moral stakes. Even things that are fairly low stakes individually um, can be high stakes when they're pervasive. Um, and in fact, even the Animoji, if it's, everyone's using Animoji and you can't do it because it doesn't track your features because you, um, your, your color, the color of your skin isn't well represented in the training data, um, then that can be high moral stakes too. And then the last dimension is the autonomy dimension, um, which is really just about where there's involvement from humans and whether the system is able to um, make significant state changes without a person being involved. So these are, this is the context that we're all working in. Um, now, what's sort of distinctive about data and AI? Well, look, it's certainly true that for any technology, from the speed bump to the bridge to the, to the car, um, human values are embedded within them. So one thing that's interesting about data and AI is that we have this opportunity to shape those values explicitly. And we can actually write them into the code in some way. And we sort of have to, because one way or another, our values are going to be there. So it's a matter of whether we choose ones that we endorse um, or whether we have ones in there that we don't endorse. And potentially that might be those that are um, being put forward by people who are in positions of power in order to achieve um, advantages for themselves. So the goal of our project is to help shape those technologies and the social structures that they're situated in so that they embody and promote democratically legitimate values. So it's important to sort of pause and stop and I'll sort of return to this question later on. Um, one of the big questions that you always get asked if you start thinking about how to incorporate um, ethics into artificial intelligence in various ways um, is which values, whose values you're going to incorporate. And we often ask this question as though we haven't had to deal with moral disagreement in any other context. Uh, but obviously moral disagreement is kind of the norm. It's something that is there by default. And what we've done over the last two and a half thousand years is evolve basically you know, the best system that we can for handling moral disagreement and making decisions. Um, and that's democracy. Uh, and it's not great, it's not perfect, um, but everything else is worse, as the famous Winston Churchill quote has it. Um, so that's what we mean by talking about democratically legitimate values. Um, I'll talk about an example of this um, later on. Uh, but let me tell you a bit more about our approach first. Okay, so our team um, is multidisciplinary. Um, we have philosophers, computer scientists, lawyers, political scientists, and sociologists. Um, each of us is coming to this field having worked um, in their own discipline on, on other things. Um, each of us is a world leading scholar in their field or a rising star. Um, we've got one of Australia's only AAAI fellows, for example. Our philosophy department at ANU is one of the top, top ones in the world. Um, so we have that disciplinary expertise that we're bringing together um, and working together to attack this problem from different sides. The specific focus, um, the kind of the technology that we're focusing on um, is the use of big data and machine learning, and in particular on the AI side, planning and optimization. Those are our areas of expertise. Um, so robotics would be an extension of that, but it's something that we are certainly looking at. We've been talking with Hannah in the past as well. So our goal is to use these disciplines to um, do work that aims to make a real difference in the world and is informed by each of our core disciplines um, and is groundbreaking in at least one. And our priorities are to do fundamental research that has substantial long-term impact. So how do we actually do that? What does that look like in this case? Um, if you go on our website, we've got uh, a bunch of different papers and sort of um, opinion pieces, media, policy submissions that are up on there. Um, but we've divided up our research into three very broad strands, and we have more specific things up on the website that you can see. Um, so the three core cool, um, strands are discovery, foundations, and design. So the first phase, which is more of the social science phase, um, is identify the risks and opportunities that are associated with the widespread deployment of data and AI, address these questions about moral disagreement, advocate democratic AI. 
And that's the sort of task that we're doing through social psychology, political science, political philosophy in particular. Uh, on the foundation side, that's about answering the fundamental questions in philosophy, theoretical computer science, law and social theory on which designing democratic AI depends. Um, that's something that we, we all contribute to from all our different perspectives. Uh, and on the design side, there's really two parts to it. One is implementing democratic AI through designing better systems and shaping uh, through designing better systems. So that might include work on um, AI planning, for example, or work on in, in machine learning in particular. Um, but also shaping the social structures that they're implemented within. Um, so that would be working on um, positive law policy regulation. Um, so standards isn't, hasn't been in particular a thing that we focused on, but um, we're certainly interested in regulation and law. So that side of it, and we've done a few policy submissions on that score. So how can we help? Why did Kate ask us to, to join on this uh, this call? And um, you know, what can we what can we do with you? Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do, we're, we're in the early stages, we were established, um, we launched in August last year. So we're still in the phase of um, shaping our research questions, and we're really keen to learn from practitioners to make sure that we're attacking the right problems. Um, on the policy and regulation side, we've been starting, we started on that from day you know, minus 250, basically. Um, but that's something that's really important to us, so we're really keen to talk to people who are engaged in those debates. Um, we're actively consulting with industry partners on how to deploy AI systems in a socially responsible way. Um, so we're keen to talk with people about how you incorporate these sets of ethical principles in a way that gives them real bite. Uh, and we're researching the effective design of AI systems to promote and instantiate democratically legitimate values. And to talk about that, I'll just run through an example which connects up with the, um, the theme of assurance. So um, I'm assuming that you can see the top right hand corner of my screen. Um, so all of you will be aware of the concerns about um, explanation in AI. This kind of connects up to the deterministic, non-deterministic um, question that we've had before. The worry is that decisions or actions that are made on the basis of um, machine learning systems are going to be difficult to explain because the system itself might include um, hundreds of thousands of variables that we can't possibly sort of attribute um, a particular causal role to each of them. Um, there's lots of work directly on um, kind of what the problems for explanation and interpretation are within AI. Um, I just want to give you an example of our kind of approach and how we bring a kind of multidisciplinary um, set of methods to attack it. So this is the work that we've got ongoing. Some of it is, um, is published, some of it is um, in progress um, from the different sides of our project. So, for example, we um, have looked at this question from the perspective of policy. Um, we made a submission with the Academy of Science and 3A, in fact, um, to the Australian Human, Human Rights Commission's discussion paper on technology and human rights. Uh, we hosted a discussion roundtable um, with the Human Rights Commissioner on that topic, um, in which we spent a considerable amount of time talking about whether there was a right to an explanation and what that might look like. Um, one of our researchers who works in AI planning um, has been developing an account of how to make um, plans explicable. Um, we also have complementary research in machine learning on explanation, um, also in data visualization on the same sort of theme. Um, that connects up with work in philosophy of science that helps us sort of answer the foundational questions as to why, why we care about explanations. Um, so what an explanation is, what counts as a good explanation. Um, we've got some work that was presented at, the, at a workshop in Europe last, um, last year on the relationship between mathematical and causal explanations, for example. Um, and also what explanations are for from the perspective of philosophy of science, um, but also the big demand for explanations within AI systems tends to come about in a normative context. So it's there as part of the GDPR, for example. Um, it's connected to the, um, the making of sort of decisions that have legally significant effects. Um, and this raises the question as to why we should care about explanations, why they matter. And that's fundamentally a question for moral and political philosophy. Um, and it's a question that by uh, answering it requires breaking new ground in moral and political philosophy. So it's a good example of a point where in order to do the research that is going to be socially beneficial, we need to break new ground in our core discipline. Uh, but obviously, to sort of articulating the general ideals is one thing, putting them into practice is another. Um, so we're working on positive law research and theoretical legal research um, on the implications of the explainability gap in AI for public and commercial law. So, for example, there's a paper coming out in the Australian Law Review assessing um, this particular question from the perspective of the automation of government decisions. 
Um, and in order to inform those kinds of practical questions, it's not enough just to look at the tech. It's also important to look at this from the perspective of what people actually want from explanations from human machine teams. And uh, we have a person on our, our project who's a social psychologist who's doing experimental research on that thing. So that's a sort of a picture of the, the way we approach these kinds of problems. It's about sort of climbing the same mountain from different sides, um, while sort of maintaining uh, sort of communications all around the mountain, back with the base station. Um, and that's our approach. We're really curious to know, um, you know, how we can help in the trust and safety framework. Um, you know, we I've put a few sort of prompting questions there. Um, I'm sure people will have different views about what the um, the normative standards are that we should be aiming at. Um, and I'd love to talk about how how it's possible to do interdisciplinary work, multidisciplinary work, um, in this kind of area and the challenges that, that raises. Um, and if anyone's curious about the um, the role of explanations and why we should care about explanations. Um, I'd be very happy to talk about that too. Um, one thing that folks often say is that if you can show that a system has acceptable results, why do you care how it gets them? Um, and that's something I'm sure that all of you will have opinions on. Um, so uh, with that, I will um, say thank you um, for having me and uh, that's it. Thanks so much, Seth. I have two questions here for you. The first one is from Robert. He was asking for you to elaborate on a particular comment. So the comment is less human involvement at crucial points. And he says, can you elaborate on this and what could be done? Yeah, sure. So I, there I'm thinking about how to put some um, sort of meat on the bones on, on autonomy without sort of inviting a discussion about, you know, whether AI systems are truly autonomous in some sense that that might mean. Um, it's one of the, so there's a lot of, um, uh, kind of canards in the discussion of um, AI and ethics that people get really sort of hung up on for a considerable period of time. So my way of framing these things has evolved um, over the time, sort of one time after time, sort of coming up against one of those canards. And the uh, one of them is when you start talking about autonomy, and then people say, well, you know, it hasn't really got a mind, it's not conceptualizing things in a certain way. Um, how can you really talk about it being autonomous? Uh, and that's fine. That, that, there's a really interesting set of philosophical discussions about that. Um, but for me, the thing that raises the moral stakes is when a system is able to make a significant um, state change, you know, cause, cause an outcome um, without a person intervening. Um, and so, you know, you could think of an example like the, um, the autonomous weapons that are put on the demilitarized zone in, uh, between North and South Korea, um, where it's possible for uh, a weapon to be triggered to fire um, simply on the basis of um, somebody sort of uh, a sense of being triggered, um, where you have a very significant state change, so potentially being shot at and killed, um, with the potential for there being no human intervention between step one and step two. Um, uh, hang on a second. Hey, sweetie. Okay, that's my answer to that question, but I'm um, uh, happy to take another one. Thank okay, you. we've got one more point. Would you like a minute, sir? So good, Ash can help. All right, fantastic. We have one more question for you. It's a bit of a long one, so bear with me as I read it out to you. It's from Dan. It's a, uh, he says, isn't one of the basic tenets of democracy that all people have a similar level of input into decision making? How do you imagine average people will be able to contribute to the values or even behaviours of new AI technology? Or are they all being produced by companies who everyday people have little control over or even visibility of? That's a great question. So look, I think that, that, ties in, that ties in with one of the things that I was um, talking about before. Um, I got so, a sticky tack. Ash has got a sticky tack. Um, Ashley, I'm just going to talk now, okay? Dad, I love to see Thank you, sweetie. Um, yeah, so basically I, I think that the general point that's being made, um, that there's an issue to do with democratic legitimacy, when so much of the decision making is being done by tech companies um, is really important. But if you give me a moment, I'll see if um, <laughs> Ash is tempted to go outside and I'll answer properly. Thanks, Seth. Um, we'll give Seth a minute and uh, he'll come back and we'll welcome him back to answer that question, I think, um, when he's got a minute. But how great is working from home with all these cute kids and animals. So who's who's urgent to go back to these offices without animals and children in them? Um, house plant people also great. Appreciate you also. Uh, I think maybe we move on to 
Andrew again, because we've now finished all of our speakers sections and we've got a really nice 20 minute period um, where Andrew's going to sort of give us some assistive uh, navigation through Miro. Oh, here comes Seth. Oh, yours, mate. Can I talk about the last one? Sorry about that. So, um, Quick now. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. So I think it's a really important question. So the first thing is that, um, look, obviously, as far as democratic decision making goes and democratic institutions go, um, you know, we don't operate a, a sort of a plebiscite for every technical question. Um, we have institutions to enable us to kind of have a rich public discussion while still allowing you know, expert opinion to be heard and given particular weight and um, and you know fundamentally having systems of accountability so that you can you, know, you can vote out the people who make decisions that you don't like. So it is certainly more about more than just sort of individual like um, the participation of every individual. Um, but at the same time, um, I do think that there are really big questions raised by the amount of power that um, doesn't reside within the sort of the gambit of, uh, of a democratic government. So we've been doing a lot of work lately at ANU. Um, most of the people on this call from ANU have been thinking about this um, on the COVID Safe app, for example. So the use of an app to support contact tracing. And, you know, in the in the case of this app, we've seen you know, heroic efforts by DTA to try and use a an unsupported Bluetooth protocol um, to uh, enable them to carry out um, support contact tracing, uh, with a number of workarounds and a number of hiccups along the way. And you know, it's um, in some ways it's more or less working, but there are some significant security flaws. Um, but at the same time, Apple and Google have rolled out an exposure notification API that um, will work beautifully, that will be very well supported. Um, but doesn't provide the same information to health authorities as the app that um, the DTA has designed. And it won't, and it won't run alongside the DTA app. Um, if we shift over to it, it will have to be a hard cut over. So that's a really good example of a case where um, a choice that's fundamentally about the, how we balance public health and privacy um, is really being taken out of our hands because, you know, we can keep using COVID safe and it's okay. Um, but it certainly would be a lot better to be able to avoid a lot of the security flaws, including ones that we haven't anticipated if it had proper support from Apple and Google. Um, but they won't provide that support unless we agree to their particular way of balancing public health and privacy. And that's something that's just going to happen more and more often in more and more areas and data and AI are clearly going to be absolutely central to that. So I do think it's a really important question. Zena, uh, your microphone's off. Zena, are you talking? Thank you so much, Kate. I was talking. <laughs> I was just saying thank you, Seth. There is one question uh, that has been entered into the question and answer uh, panel within WebEx. So, Seth, I'll probably get you to answer that within that panel because, Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're running into Andrew's time at the moment. Yeah, I think that's great. Zena, thanks so much for your help um, with those questions. Just before I hand over to Andrew, I just wanted to draw people's attention to the box um, on the site uh, that has some questions that I've sourced from some regulators. So from AMSA and DASA, I've modified those questions slightly for this format. But if you're interested in the regulatory perspective and the kinds of big questions that they're focusing on at the moment, um, there's a space on that board to um, put down your thoughts uh, there. But I'll hand over to you, Andrew, take us away until 12.30. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So yes, I've just drawn everybody's attention to your um, uh, your questions. Uh, so that's uh, exactly what I was going to uh, start off with. So uh, and also for those of you who haven't um, act, interacted with the the boards uh, during this uh, the last uh, you know 18 minutes or so, uh, feel free to to look at those questions and add uh, any um, uh, additional questions. So each of the speakers have a box. Uh, and I see um, uh, Zena and Ellen's, uh, you've definitely got uh, some good participation there. Um, but yeah, if you feel uh, you've got some questions or if you've got some answers to those questions that each of the speakers have posed, uh, please go ahead and, and answer them. So in this uh, the last uh, session, I, I, I do want to sort of try and draw uh, people's attention to what I've uh, got on the screen at the moment. Uh, or to the um, what looks to be the the uh, the, the brain uh, mapping, uh, and I see that there has been some additions to that. So fantastic, well done, um, team. Uh, so this is going to help us with uh, sort of you know I guess explore uh, the the shape of of the chapter, uh, what we need to include in the chapter. So if you think of it in that perspective, 
Um, you know, it looks like we've got some really good um, uh, suggestions on the from a safety perspective, uh, but we're pretty limited on the trust side. Um, so uh, I do encourage anybody to uh, go ahead and, and add uh, to that uh, or uh, reinforce or, or add subsections to the ones that are already there. So please go ahead and do that. Um, now, the other thing that I also want you to, to draw attention to is this technology roadmap. So this uh, part of the board is really trying to, uh, I guess, uh, paint the picture of, of what is going on right now. And you've heard from a number of the speakers uh, today around some of the active areas of research uh, and active, uh, you know, uh, activities that are happening. Um, so that can, that's definitely, you know, uh, leading into what's happening now. But you might have some other uh, key aspects of what's happening right now. Uh, and so this is trying to understand uh, from a roadmap perspective, you know, what's uh, available now, what's being worked on right now, um, and what are some of the things in the 5, 15, and 30 year time frame. So if I can get uh, encourage people to uh, to have a go uh, at placing uh, some some ideas or some known uh, activities on the technology roadmap, um, that'll be awesome. Uh, and while we're doing this, I think um, you know we can certainly. Uh, I know uh, we've got most people on mute because it's a, a webinar. But if anybody has any questions or things that we can um, sort of discuss. Uh, you can definitely use the uh, the chat function uh, to, to put down any questions uh, on what I'm asking. So question number one is to extend the, the mind map in terms of the, uh, the, the um, structure of the chapter, the key components we're going to need to, to include in the chapter. Uh, so that's what uh, that's what this board's about. And then from a technology roadmap perspective, what's available now? Uh, what's being worked on with delivery in 5, 15, 30 year time frames. So I think um, uh, if, uh, Zena, if you can keep an eye on the, the questions again, if anybody adds any questions, um, please feel free to, to pipe in and, and ask those questions. Will do, Andrew. Thank you. And this is great when we see the the quiet collaboration that's happening. Like if anybody's been in active workshops, you know these types of sessions when we do a bit of a the interaction, it's quite can be quite noisy, especially uh, when. So it is. Uh, it's still even though we've been doing this probably for uh, now coming on three months, um, it's still quite eerie that uh, we see this collaboration happening in silence. Some might say that that's a positive thing. Good. Looks like we're getting some good uh, input on the trust side and other aspects. people doing this, I do want to just reiterate what we said at the beginning, and that was the fact that uh, this board will be made available um, for uh, another two weeks. Um, and so I do encourage you, so as you walk away and you go, you know what, I you know, wish I'd put that on there, you, know, you can definitely come back and do so. Uh, and we'll be, ca we'll be capturing um, key snapshots as we go. Um, and also, if you think, you know what, I know someone that should be part of this discussion and will have some really great input. So if you do know of those people, please uh, feel free to share the link. Um, it is a public link, uh, so there shouldn't be any problems with them getting access to it. As well as the, uh, you know, you can easily send through uh, an email uh, to all the co-chairs.
Andrew, I have a question that's popped up in the chat. Um, it's from Ravi and the question is, will there be any consideration of cost versus benefit to industry of pursuing assurance of autonomy or use this criteria to prioritise level of autonomy in sectors to target? That's a really good question. Um, and I think uh, when it comes to, um, uh, I guess, prioritising uh, a lot of things, you know, at the end of the day, it's got to make sense. Um, it's got to make sense from a, a philosophical perspective. It's got to make sense from an ethical perspective, uh, but it also has to make sense from a business perspective. So I think with that regard, I think there is definitely a cost element. One of the things I've noticed definitely from the resource um, sector is that, uh, you know, there was a lot of apprehension at the very beginning. Uh, there was a lot of misunderstanding and, and we hadn't quite developed and, and provided enough confidence uh, to the industry to demonstrate uh, cost savings uh, or um, uh, production efficiencies and productivity efficiencies. But I think uh, one of the reasons that, uh, especially the autonomous haulage, autonomous drilling, um, and some of these other, um, uh, I guess, uh, capabilities that uh, that uh, remove the variability out of the equation, uh, are definitely seeing uh, where we, we've got demonstrated case studies now of um, of the uh, the business side of it. So not only is it uh, protecting people, uh, it is actually um, more cost effective. Uh, removing the variability out of the out of the operations, um, and so there are some examples of direct um, a bottom line cost savings, uh, and so there is that uh, that realization happening. I think we'll see that um, across the board in in many other industries, um, and so I think that's it is being considered, uh, you know, at industry by industry perspective. Um, but, you know, that could be an aspect uh, as well from a discussion point uh, within the roadmap um, that the, uh, the, the use of, of robotics and automation does have a variety of dimensions uh, to it um, and cost and productivity is one of them. The other one that uh, probably gets uh, that gets uh, talked quite a bit about, um, and this is one that we're, we're battling with from a national perspective, is the narrative around uh, robots, the perception that robots and automation means less jobs. Um, and I think uh, we've seen many cases where that's not the case. Um, it actually can uh, create further economic development. Um, and German, countries like Germany have definitely uh, demonstrated that. Uh, with their um, manufacturing capability, uh, but there's uh, also uh, many other countries that have also demonstrated that. So that uh, I think also uh, ties to that um, question. Andrew, I've got another question for you. What are your thoughts on proving trustworthiness of machines that may make good decisions that are perhaps difficult to predict, but can be explained in hindsight? I'm thinking about some of the moves made by AlphaGo against Settle in 2016. Really good question. Um, so I think this is also another thing that's uh, generating uh, the ability to collaborate, or the the no, not necessarily the ability to collaborate, but the motivation to collaborate. Um, so I think it's you know the more we share, uh, and it's not just sharing where things um, go right; it's actually sharing when things go wrong, uh, and more importantly, what's happened uh, to mitigate that uh, or, or to uh, to uh, react to that, um, that uh, I think the more we do that, uh, the the uh, the greater our confidence um, in uh, various uh, aspects of the not only the technology, the base technology itself, but also how we actually uh, implement, how we um, you know fit it in with with uh, from a from a system safety perspective. Um, so I think uh, that that trustworthiness will will increase. Uh, the more, and that's sort of um, building on that hindsight perspective. So, you know, the the only way that you can, uh, you know, um, reliably get uh, insight into uh, future events is to look twice as far or more um, in the past. And so we've got to learn from the past to be able to predict the future. Can I jump in, Andrew, on that comment? I, I think uh, it's a really, really good question and the Lisa Doll example is is excellent and I think there are a lot of things that have been done proactively 
that anticipate those lecidol uh, alpha-GO sort of moves, right? So the current um, test and evaluation space uh, is moving very heavily into simulated environments. And so you've come up with parameters of a context or a scenario and autonomous systems can be tested in simulation in virtual environments uh, very strongly before they get um, allowed out, as it were, into the real world, into constrained testing environments uh, or test ranges, physical test ranges. And um, it's all a graduated process. So I don't think one of, the, one of the issues you have with new technologies is that the inductive model isn't necessarily successful, which is to say, looking at the past isn't going to help you because you've got this new technology and new capability and therefore some unpredictability. So you don't just go straight from inventing an idea, sorry, a technology and then putting it into the field. There's really a long process of uh, t &E, getting all the way to real societal trials. So for example, in Queensland and Logan, uh, Google Wing is flying uh, and delivering coffee with their drones. So if you're looking for a cuppa, um, Google's offering, and uh, it's very restricted. It, it's really very constrained. The SORA model that they're using for those trials really precludes a huge range of actions. So, for example, Google themselves have to make the coffee because they're not trusted for the drones to go to a coffee shop because the coffee stuff, the barista training programs don't cover drone safety, right? So there are these limited ways that these systems get put out into the world and for them to be observed and so their behaviours are observed, and if they do do a strange move, like in that um, AlphaGo game, what has happened in the world of Go is that the best Go players in the world are now learning from the DeepMind uh, programs to change the way they play Go. And that's what we're going to see happening, is that these machines and algorithms are going to be making decisions and behaving. And the humans are going to be watching and seeing them in test beds and then learning and then potentially changing their own behaviour because they might say, look, Suppose it wasn't a, a, a Go board that was being uh, considered here with AlphaGo. Suppose it was the distribution of humanitarian resources to refugees. And that Go stone is actually a drone delivering some resources to a particular geographic location. If it turns out logistically that that's the best way to distribute those resources to those refugees, then humans can learn from that and then start to plan that type of distribution model into the future. So there's actually going to be this shared intelligence model moving forward, which is um, it's going to be done in a really quite a careful way, but um, but also an exciting and and uh, and uh, you know innovative way. Does anyone else on the panel would like to speak to this question before we head out? I just add a little bit, uh, Kate, on what you're saying. So it's interesting that uh, human not just learn from watching them, uh, watching the play, but they also learn because they are basically have a counterpart that actually is uh, better, and we can even uh, slightly adjust the the computer game so that it's slightly better than us, so then it improves us a little bit better and keep on going like this. So I think it's beneficial in both ways. Sensitive to that we've only got two minutes left. So if there's any questions, Zena, that's coming out of the chat box, or if any of our speakers would like to say a word before we go, uh, we will finish promptly at 12.30. Um, so we will uh, thank you very much for the amazing amounts of effort going on on the Miro board and the questions asked uh, of our speakers. And also my, my huge thanks to the speakers themselves and to Sue Kay and uh, Data61 for setting up this infrastructure. And Andrew, who's been our Miro champion. We've all learned a lot uh, about Miro with his assistance. Um, there's been a lot of work put in to enable this workshop today. Um, we really appreciate your help. So fill out the survey. Um, and, and keep going on the Miro board for the next two weeks. Um, your contributions to that board will become the source from which we will write the chapter. Uh, so please, you know, it's not less is more, more is more. So, um, you know, keep adding that content. So any last thoughts from the panel? I'll just quick, quickly uh, sign off. So I want to thank everybody for the, uh, the effort. Uh, I see a lot of engagement, so well done, uh, everybody. Uh, and I do want to also acknowledge uh, the effort Elliot, who uh, we've uh, we've built on um, the work here. I do want to highlight. Uh, I've got the the link to the survey uh, on the green board, which sort of talks about the uh, the the um, the version one of the the guideline. So you can click on that and and use that to to guide people as well as uh, what was sent out. But uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, it's been a great uh, great workshop.
you for everyone who's participating as well. Thanks for the opportunity for this. This will be interesting. Yeah, just to say thanks. Um, Miro is great. Um, so I've just been beaming away at that. But yeah, thanks for bringing this all together, Sue, Sue Kate, Andrew, um, and uh, Zena and Hannah and Ellen. It's nice to see you all. Thanks, everyone. And just echoing our thanks and thank you to everyone on the Miro board. I see a lot of names that I recognise from different communities around Australia. So thank you all for taking time out of your day to